against the white establishment and um, they were not really addressing the black artist at that time and, and Benny said hey come on you know you got to get this together he was really at the forefront of it just a strong just strong individual he's never so up there that he isn't humble enough to help young people who are coming along and and really just try to keep things moving. Things haven't changed that much. You know, we're still out here struggling and there aren't that many people in, in the major museums and galleries. And I'm sure Benny can tell you that. I set out like most uh, young people with ideas of being something, in this case, being an artist. And at the time I set out, being an artist was basically looked at a one person, one way thing. There was no setup for it. And you know, we, we basically existed on the idea of the Van Gogh thing. You know, you go out and you express yourself and things like that. And that's what uh, your early idea that you think that what you're gonna do is if you wanna be a painter, you're gonna paint pictures or draw or sculpt. And then it would be looked at for what you did or didn't do. Uh, but that, of course, was ab abruptly changed the moment I entered into the real world. What the most of us saw were illustrators in, in the magazines like the Saturday and the Post and Collier, and that meant Norman Rockwell and people like that. But Norman Rockwell kind of artist did strike a chord with us because it was telling a story about a people. It was just that they were white people, but it was easy to superimpose that you could be telling it your own story, and it could be different colors. And all of us had stories. We all went fishing. We all uh, had girlfriends. We all picked berries, or we all uh, read the comics and everything. So there was a similarity that we grew up with uh, reading about, uh, uh, looking at uh, illustrators like Norman Rockwell. And the great majority of us from that background thought we wanted to be illustrators, because we had no idea. We, we couldn't go to the, to the library in our town. We, we were not allowed to go to the libraries. And my high school had a library that was maybe four feet by eight feet. We were sharecroppers. so basically sharecroppers. Children did not go to high school. Fortunate for me, my parents insisted I go to high school, which was a struggle, and the, and the white overseers of, of the plantation agreed that I could go to high school when it was rain too bad to work in the field. So I only went to high school five months a year, but I was lucky, and the teachers stepped right in, and they would say their biology lessons and all kinds of stuff, and they would catch me up because the ones of us from the country, there were a few towns kids that did much better, was so poorly uh, educated and had to work on the farm. That's the foundation from which I come from. I come from a very strong family, a very creative family, and things who we made the best of nothing practically. All my kids, sisters uh, come from a family of 10, went to college and became uh, pretty good uh, professional people. And all of them, all my brothers, six of us, every two years, one of us would go into the military and that person would take over sending money home to the rest of the family to help them. So that enabled my mother to buy a house, the brother and sister to go to college and so forth. And then the last two years, because we joined the Air Force, it was four years, then you would save up your money to add to your GI Bill when you went to college. I luckily won a Forge Club scholarship to go to one of the black colleges, Fort Valley State College, for two years. And when that was up, I could either go back to Atlanta and go to work in restaurants and things, being a bus boy or something like that, or things like that. But luckily, the Korea War came along in 1950, and I volunteered for that, and that was my exit out of the South, and that was the exit of a lot of us. And you'll st you still see that happening. A great majority of the uh, people that you see in the military now, white and black, are actually in there as a vehicle to get away from what they are in. A lot of us were not exposed to good schools, and, uh, and not in terms of just formal education, but the uh, things that come along with good schools and good neighborhoods like libraries and museums and things like that. So personally, I was not exposed to that. I came up in a very rural situation after the service, after being in the Air Force for four years. Uh, I, in this, I, I uh, went to the Chicago Art Institute and that was 1954. And now I'm thrown into the fine art world, totally oblivious of what that meant. I'd never been in a museum before in my life. And my, my peer group 
were kids that had come from all over the country. They had been to good schools and things and stuff. And, but I did know what I wanted to do. I, that's the one thing that I had as an advantage in terms of fighting you know, all the other things I had. And I was very happy with where I come from. I, and I really identified with what I was. And that was a, being an African American. And also my African American experiences. Like I said earlier, I had seen how those could be transposed over other experiences, I used Norman Rockwell, things like that. And, but I was totally unpopular in school. I was so unpopular at Chicago Art Institute. I was never invited to any of the exhibitions because my work was not acceptable. I was doing work, representational work, during the time of the abstract expressionists. That was the heyday of the abstract expressionists. And uh, the only thing that I should have just automatically qualified to be in was the veteran exhibition. Every year they had an exhibition for veterans. And I was a veteran and I was not even invited to that. That just gives an idea of how out of it I was. And I've always been out of the mainstream. I stay out of the mainstream. I'm still out of it, uh, no matter what happens for me. I was one of the lucky artists, African-American artists, who was in a Madison Avenue Gallery. I, I got into Madison Avenue Gallery in 1962 and had, started having major exhibitions. And, I, and it, it was the typical route. This was a little before the black awareness, a few years uh, before the civil rights were bleeding over into the visual arts and, the, and literature and things like that. And I was, it was going fine. And every two years, I would have this exhibition and I was you know, developing people liking my work. And then one day, I'm in the gallery and I'm in the back, and I noticed that, because I was doing both black and white people, that's what I always wanted to do, I just wanted to do people. And I noticed all of the images of black people, anything black was hanging on the wall. There was nothing of mine on black. It was all out in the, uh, that work was in group shows and things. So I go to the dealer, and I said, look, uh, you're not showing the black people I do this. She said, they don't sell. She said, they don't sell. I said, but, and there were some other artists in the gallery, very well-known artists, Raphael Sawyer, Haim Gross, and people like that. I said, well, you show their work. You show when they came over from Europe. I said, you show all their work. You show them on the Lower East Side. You show their whole story. And this is my story. You know, this is where I come from. And she said, well, I just don't think it sells. And so I got a John Hay Whitney, this was 1965, I got a John Hay Whitney Fellowship. And my next show, my third show with the gallery was scheduled for 1966. So I decided I would go down south and just do my biography, my autobiography, only black people, you know, and do all that and then bring my show back. And so I brought my show back and uh, I said to, uh, oh, she said, oh no, that'll never sell. And I went to those audits. I went to Raphael Sawyer and I went to Haim Gross. I said, look, she shows all of your history. She shows your, you know, like I just said. And I said, you got to support me. You got to let them, my history be shown. And they went to her and said, show his body of work. And she did. She put it on exhibition. That was a reception. And she refused to come out of the back. And I realized then I had to go out and fight. It, didn't, it was not enough for me to be in a gallery. I was getting reviewed in the paper, the Times and all. I had to go out and fight that our, rep, our physical representation and our stories be shown. And so the uh, Metropolitan Museum came along with the Harlem On My Mind exhibition and they were so disdainful of any African-American input. And so that's when I and some others organized the Black Emergent Culture Coalition. And then we started demanding the artists, for the first time in the 60s, started to relate to each other. No longer was it going to just be a one-on-one, -on -one, you go out there by yourself like, uh, you know, Don Quixote and fight the windmills. We started identifying with each other and being able to communicate and being very happy about it. We'd never done that before. We never had that. The, uh, the older artists before us, Hale Woodruff, uh, Norman, uh, Norman Lewis, and Jake Lawrence, and all had been one people doing one thing and stuff like that. And they, uh, most of them came along with us. But we were the young Turks. We were the troublemakers. We demanded certain things, and we were not for gradualization and things like that. You know, the Met at that time saw itself more as well, showing people dead, you know, to be dead 25 years. So what are we doing up here? When the Whitney down there says it's the Whitney Museum of American Art, that's where we should be, because that's now. And they're 
wearing this banner at the Whitney Museum of American Art. So then we got together, the, uh, our organization, and came up with ultimatums. Cause you didn't deal, you, de you had ultimatums. You didn't ask for anything. That was old style. You know, you go in and ask them, you know, would they please do this and that. And they say, well, we're working on it and stuff. And, you know, we'll talk to Jake Lawrence and all and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we came with ultimate. We wanted them to have an exhibition of work. We wanted them to buy the work, buy artwork. We wanted them to, uh, in their uh, small gallery, have an individual uh, uh, exhibition. And we wanted them to have an a African American to curate this. Well, they agreed to that then, and then they reneged on everything except uh, having a show. And so we said, no way, we're going to protest. The Black Emergency Culture Coalition on that opening of the exhibition at the, the Black Art Exhibition at the Whitney held a press conference at uh, the Studio Museum. And the only media showed up was uh, the uh, class from uh, Columbia, a religious group, and a newspaper from Germany. And I get a call, because I'm the spokesperson now, I get a call from CBS. And they said, Mr. Andrews, if you show up with your group down in front of the Whitney, when it, when it opens for the reception, we will give you a half an hour. And if we have no argument with those artists, they wanted us to have a confrontation. And if we have no argument with those artists, we, if they feel they need to show, they need to show. It's, not, it's between the Whitney and us, it's not between those artists. Well, the, it was such a sad thing because of the opening night, a lot of the artists went and they felt bad and some of the wives threatened to cure, uh, divorce their husbands, and a lot of artists are still out of, uh, feeling bad about being in the show. And I got a call from Romare Beard saying, Benny, I told them I didn't want to be in the show, and they gone and borrowed something of mine. And I want to be in it while I can help, I can do it or not. And that's what they did with a lot of the old established artists. They just went to collectors and galleries and borrowed work. But anyway, we, and we had a protest show downtown, which was uh, in a black gallery, which was covered a little. So that was part of it. It takes a lot of people to make a little thing. So when we look back in all history with all groups, we single out a very few people. But the reason it really happened is that large group that don't get credit, they're just identified as masses. Life for uh, what I did and a, and a large number of people I was fortunate to be part of, it's like a relay race. And we were lucky that we had to bar a little while. But we got it from somebody and we pass it on to somebody. So that little stretch that we ran, it's just a link and a chain that goes both ways. And you have to understand that, that you are no alpha or no or omega of anything. You're lucky to be just have had that little thing for a while. If they don't know that she's leotine price, she still can't get a taxi.